Okay, our first presenter is Lamise Mohammed from Western Michigan University. Hi everyone, my name is Lamise Mohammed, PhD student from Geoscience Department in Western Michigan University. And first of all, I want to thank the Imagine Competition staff for giving me this opportunity uh, to present my work today, which is about shear zones, effects on groundwater flow in southern Sinai, Egypt, remote sensing and geophysical constraints. First of all, um, most of the arid countries suffer from uh, one of the main problems is to finding water resources. And actually my country, Egypt, uh, suffer, suffers from the same problem. And that's because uh, it's considered one of the hyper arid countries because it's low annual average precipitation and also about 90% of its land is desert. So it's very important to find, sorry, it's very important to find other areas with uh, more water resources. And here, my study area is located in southern Sinai, in Egypt. And that's because it receives annual precipitation more than 60 millimeters per year, and in some rain, even about 300 millimeters per year. And this is trim image for the precipitation for uh, the study area in southern Sinai. This map shows the study area. It's located here in southern Sinai, Egypt. And the study area is called Wadi Fran. And this wadi is, consists of, um, consists of some um, small wadis, as you see here. The objectives of this study is to delineate the spatial distribution of dikes and fracture systems, like shear zones and faults, and also to understand the role of these dikes and the structures that play an affecting in groundwater below by developing a conceptual model. And then to validate the conceptual model and finally to identify potential well locations of high protectivity. This map shows the geologic setting of Wadi Firan Basin. And as you see here, the main lithologic units is Pan-African basement complex that overlays by um, Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary successions. And these are the distribution. Uh, of some faults in the study area. So I'll start with the first element of the structural elements in this uh, basin. And the first one is faults. And as you see here, there are many trends of the faults in the basin. And the first one is basement trends. And this basement trend shows various trends. And the second one is Syrian arc trends, which takes east, west trend. And these faults are right lateral faults. And the third one is the Gulf of Suez trend. As you see here, it takes north, west, south, east, and these are normal faults. And the, finally, the Gulf of Aqaba trend, which is uh, north, north, east, south, 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 west, and it's slip, uh, strike a slip, uh, left lateral faults. The second element is the shear zones. And actually, the shear zones concentrated in this area around St. Catherine area in Fran Basin. So this uh, image, Google Earth image, shows the distribution of the shear zones here. And we found that most of the shear zone has average width, about 30 meters, and the length ranges from half kilometer to three kilometers. Third element is um, dike. And in this area, we can see mafic and felsic dikes. And the felsic dikes are uh, more resistant to weathering and takes trend northeast direction. Uh, on the other hand, the mafic dikes are less resistant to weathering, and these dikes take both trends northeast and northwest. So this map here shows the, um, the, two, the two main types of dikes, the mafic dikes and felsic dikes. And as you see here, the mafic dikes represented by blue lines here, and the felsic dikes with green lines. Now to develop our conception mo model. We found that groundwater movement is mainly controlled by the distribution and the trends of faults and shears, and to some extent by dikes. The fault zone, which are parallel or making low angle uh, with the groundwater flow directions, represents a preferable or a good pathway for the groundwater flow because it's relative low, uh, it's relative high permeability. And the fault zone actually is differentiated into impermeable, core, that's surrounded on both sides by damage zone. And you can think of dikes in the same way as we see here in faults, 
Also, dikes have an impermeable core and shelled weather margins, um, and this pronounced more in mafic dikes, which show uh, um, low resistance to weathering. So here, this cartoon shows the fault core. As you see here, this fault core is impermeable, and it's surrounded by both sides with damage soon. So here in our assumption, we say that the water is captured here to the, to the deformed fault zone along the um, up gradient part here, and then move downward with the gradient along the fault in the fracture sides, and then it expels at the down gradient part here. And this, at this part, we can find the accumulation of water. And that's because of the sudden decrease of permeability between the fractures around the fault and the surrounding rock. To validate our conception model, we firstly used remote sensing, and we started to uh, select one of the main rain events that happened in this area, and our rain event happened uh, in between 17 and 18 of January 2010. So this map shows a trim for this rain event in the Wadi Fran. Then we uh, get two radar image, MVSAT radar image, one before the rain event and the other one after the rain event. So now we have two radar images, one in the dry season and the other one after the rain event, so in the uh, wet season. And we used these two images to get a color composite radar image and we use this to show us the areas that shows uh, um, more soil moisture. So to make it easier for you, we can see here two main colors, the reddish colors and the greenish or bluish color. So this reddish color gives us an indication that in these areas, there is a variation in soil moisture between before and after the rain event. So these areas has more soil moisture. While the greenish areas and the bluish areas uh, tell us that there is no variation in soil moisture between before and after the rain event. So here again, if we focused on the area of the shear zones. This is a color composite image, radar image in the same area. And these are the, dis the distribution of the shear zones. We can see here that the soil moisture of red areas are located along the shear zone. So we can know from this image that the shear zone maybe acts like a net for the groundwater and give us indication that these paths are the good paths for the groundwater because in these areas there are more soil moisture. We will focus um, later on these three areas, A, P, and C. We uh, made three field trips to the area and we collected these photos for, from field observation. And we can see here a very good, uh, beautiful green areas along the shear zones. Here and here. And here at the intersection of two or three shear zones here. Also here along this shear zone. And here and here. Then we used very low frequency method. And in this method, um, the submarine army stations uh, send magnetic field with low frequency, and this magnetic field, primary magnetic field, it gives us another secondary magnetic field when it intersects with a conductive fracture zone. And we can, uh, uh, we can record the tilt values by using this instrument, it's called CVLF instrument. So here, for example, if we have a conductive fracture zone, vertical conductive fracture zone here, and we, we made a survey perpendicular to this fracture zone, it gives us a profile like this, with peak and the trough of tilt persons, and the midpoint between the peak and the trough located above the conductive fracture zone. So to make it easier for us, we convert the tilt person to Fraser filter person. And so finally, we can get a peak of this data above the conductive fracture zone. And this map shows the distribution of the shear zones, and also these dots uh, are the profiles, the VLF profiles perpendicular to these shear zones. So this is the first example of the VLF profile. You can see here this profile perpendicular to these shear zones, and it gives us peaks above 
or um, adjacent to these shear zones. And these peaks are a good indicator that in these areas, there are fracture, fractures conductive zones. So we can find water there. Another example, in B here, this is a profile. This profile perpendicular to these shear zones and give us peaks adjacent to these shear zones. Another example here, this one, and give us a big peak. And this is the last example. Give us these two peaks. So finally, just to remind you um, of our assumption model, we said that the water is captured to the deformed fault zone along the, its upgradient part, and then the, the water moves downward with the gradient along the fault plane, and then it's built at the down gradient part here. So if we integrated all of, the, all of our data, field observation and remote sensing data, besides the very low frequency profiles, and we uh, use our GIS environment, we get this map. And this map give us the potential well locations or, of, or the areas of high potentiality, as you see here with red areas. And then we correlated these areas with the already digged potential wells in the study area. And we find a good correlation between, between them. So most of our areas already, there are wells already digged there, and these wells are uh, potential wells. And also we have, still have more high potential areas that are good areas recommended for digging in new wells. But we can see also other wells that are not, are not corresponding to our potential areas. So these wells need more study for us. Like we studied here the case that the faults <laughs> are giving uh, or are making low angle with the groundwater flow. So what about if the faults making high angle with the groundwater flow? Or what about if the faults are perpendicular to the groundwater flow? What will happen to the water? Will it redirect it or how it will work? Also, the dikes, our, um, the, dikes the third um, structural element, how it will act? Will it direct, redirect the groundwater flow or it will stop the groundwater flow? So these areas need more study from us. I want to acknowledge my supervisors, Prof. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Sultan and Dr. William Sack, and also my colleagues, Dr. Tarek Anand, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed, and Abu Talib Zaki. And special thanks to my husband and my daughters who supported me today. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you've thought uh, further on in your research, once you dig all of these wells, will they impact, say, someone farther on down the fault line, uh, just in pulling enough groundwater out? So if I dig a well and my neighbor digs a well and then four people down the road, have you looked at that groundwater modeling to see what the, the impact would be for all of the persons along that sheer fault line? Actually, this is what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to find um, a good software for uh, groundwater modeling in fracture uh, aquifer and I am planning to integrate all of all of these in this model to see how it will work but in in, in this area I found that that you know the Bedouin people the original people live there they only just dig the, the well so they found water and they don't care if they found more water or less water and when it dry they just keep it and try to dig another well in another area so yeah, it's not so accurate sure. to depend on, on what they are looking for, but I, I'm planning to build a model for this area. Very nice, thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you. The 18 wells that you used, were they existing wells in the area, study area? Yeah. They weren't drilled as part of the project? No. Okay. They, they already there. These wells I already there. Okay, and do you, if you had the funding, would you drill more wells as a function of, what would you do in the future as far as drilling wells? That's exactly what I'm dreaming to do. I want, I don't want only this study to be just a study in papers. I want to apply it in my area to see if it really works or not. So I'm leaning right now after finishing uh, the first part of my research to continue by modeling to be uh, more 
sure about my results and then to to try to do this in the in the real world i mean to maybe just select one or two areas uh, according to my conceptual model and to try to dig wells and see if it is well if these wells will be productive or 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 my study are fake <laughs> are you in the paper it says you're looking at using this methodology over in other arid parts of the world? Yes. So you really would like to expand yes. the use of this model? Yes, true. Okay, and how do you intend to extend, extend the research to uh, the paper looks in some ways preliminary and obviously you'd like to develop this more reproduce the model. What, what is your vision longer term? My vision in longer term to with the model. Okay, I, I I not lie to you. I I really dream to dig, for example, one or two wells in in one of these areas and to and to see if my conception model is right or wrong. And if it's right, so I want to continue in other areas because I this will be a proof that I already success here and I found water here. So I can reapply my method, my integration method in other arid areas and to try to find more water. So yeah, my, my first step is to, first of all, to be sure of my conceptual model by building a model for uh, this fractured aquifer and later on to try to dig wells and to see if, if there's water or, or no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one maybe unrelated question, just maybe just a curiosity. Um, the water in the false lines, do they actually serve to lubricate those false lines and maybe, you know, have an impact on seismic activity? And if you dewater those fractures, would that have a negative correlation to the future potential of seismic activity? I'm just making this up as I sit here, um, but I'm just curious if that's even I, if that I, connection even exists. Yeah, it's, it's a good question actually. Um, when I was uh, searching for my data, I thought of this and I uh, searched for uh, seismic the seismic activity in the area, and I found that most of these faults are non-active faults. So yeah, I and. I found maybe micro seismic events, very small, and it was uh, very uh, uh, long time ago. So yeah, it's non-active fault. Hi. Um, do you, will your model now, or do you think it could predict how much water you might find at a particular area, or how long it might take to recharge that, based upon a certain amount of precipitation? Um, to answer this, it needs, you know, to start in my model and to um, calculate uh, the amount and to know and to compare it with the recharge and to know how long it will stay. But this, to answer these questions, it, it needs more work for me. And I think I, I'll be able to answer it more after I finish my model. You think field work, actually drilling some wells and getting some actual data would help that? Yeah, and I, I, I think also that this area is need more organization for digging wells because, you know, people there just dig and just take water and when the well dry, just leave it and try to find another area. So it's not organized and this may affect on the amount of the groundwater there. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I have a technical question. Um, what kind of modeling uh, software did you use? I, I didn't start my modeling yet. You mean the groundwater model? Yeah, the, for the fractured aquifer, I didn't start it yet, but I was thinking on, I have um, different choices between three or four softwares, and I'm still reading about them to find a good one to start with. Oh, okay, so, so the analysis you've done was based on just um, the remote sensing and field observations and geophysical profiles. Oh, thank you. 